Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Leslie presents. And now your host, Paul Leslie. It is our pleasure to welcome pianist, vocalist, composer, music teacher, solo artist, and member of the Woody Allen New Orleans Jazz Band, Mr. Connell Phelps. Thank you so much for giving us this interview. It's a pleasure, and thank you very much for having me on your show. I was hoping you could tell us about where you were born and how you started with music. I was born, believe it or not, in Zambia, in uh, Central Africa, because my father was um, a language specialist and moved out there when Zambia gained their independence. We lived there for a few years, then we moved to Mexico, and we lived there for three more years, again because of my father's line of work. And so I didn't see England until I was about five years old and spent the rest of my time there until I moved to New York about 12 years ago now. I first formally got into music when I was about nine years old, and I have to say thanks to my dear old dad, thanks to my father, who was always a great jazz lover his whole life. Though he never took it up professionally, he played piano at home, he did the odd gig locally in the pubs, and uh, used to play all the time at home. And I was, as a little boy, just fascinated with the piano because when he would play, I used to, you know, love to listen. And one day he said, hey, come over here. I'm going to teach you something. And he taught me how to play Boogie Woogie. That was the first thing I ever played on the piano. I don't know if you or your listeners are familiar with Boogie Woogie. It's a very uh, full-bodied sound which really needs no band. It's a, you know, pounding left hand and all the kind of jumping, swinging right hand. And at that age, obviously, I couldn't manage all of that. In fact, my hands were so small, I couldn't even do the left-hand part with my left hand alone. So he taught me to do it with two hands while he played the other, the rest of the stuff. And that's how I got started, and I just used to love it. Kept at it all through my uh, school days. It became my life. Although at that age, you know, I never dreamt it would become my profession. I just loved it and used to do it all the time. Can you tell us about the types of music that you grew up around, what type of music you heard in the house? I would say a huge mixture. I mentioned my father already, who who was predominantly a jazz fan. So there's always jazz being played in the house, either on record or on the radio or him at the piano. And the kind of jazz he loved was people like Oscar Peterson, that kind of straight-ahead swinging jazz. He also loved the jazz that came into vogue in the early 60s, what was later called hard bop and bebop and that kind of stuff. That would be going on just about every day somewhere in the house. I was, you know, exposed to a lot of that. My mother, who I haven't mentioned yet, is maybe more musical than all of us, although she never learned to play an instrument. She never studied as a kid, but she loves music, and she would have the radio going on all the time. Even to this day, she just seems to know every piece of music that you might run into. A lot of classical music, popular music from the Americas, from the 20s on, all the great singers and all that kind of stuff was going on at home. And when I first started, after my dad introduced me to the instrument, and we, you know, used to just play at home, when he saw that I was really into it, he said, look, you should have a good teacher because he felt he wasn't able to teach me a lot of the rudiments and the theory of music and that kind of thing. So he found me a teacher who mainly taught me classical piano. So I was learning to read music and that kind of thing. And right from the beginning, pretty much, I was learning classical music, which I also loved, you know, and, and had been used to that all the time at home. I think from our years living in Mexico, I was so young, it's hard to remember a lot of it, but we would have the radio on all the time over there. They would be playing what they called Musica Tropicana, which is music from basically any Hispanic country of the world. So you'd get music from Cuba, from Mexico, from the Caribbean, the Spanish Caribbean, and everything from Calypso to Merengues to Mambo and all that kind of stuff. Much later in life, when I moved to London to conservatory to study classical music, but being in London, like being in New York City, you know, it's a huge melting pot of all kinds of wonderful things, including music. And there I encountered by accident a lot of what 
I just described as Musica Tropicana, and they had everything from salsa to Cuban to merengue and all that kind of thing in London. And it, I immediately identified with it, and I couldn't quite understand why at the time. And along with my classical studies and along with always playing jazz, I became fascinated and very much involved in the Latin music scene in London. Still to this day, I'm very busy playing with several wonderful Cuban groups in New York, as well as all the jazz I do. A variety of things. It's very good, difficult to say what kind of music you like when you, there's so much music out there and so much of it is, is wonderful. In recent years, I've had the chance to play some Brazilian music, which I love. I don't, I wouldn't uh, call myself any kind of expert at it. I don't know too much about it, but it's, uh, you know, wonderful music and music from Venezuela and all kinds of things. So I, I love a lot of different styles of music. Something that was kind of interesting that a past guest brought up, Michael Utley, a piano player with Jimmy Buffett's band, uh -huh. he, had, he had mentioned that he felt like the music that you talked about, all the, the Latin type music, in, in a way blends with the music of America in New Orleans. And I was wondering if you viewed all these other kind of world styles of music as much of a departure from what you do with the Woody Allen New Orleans Jazz Band. Or do you see similarities? I would say both to answer that question. I think on the surface, they appear very, very different. There's not too many musicians who are deeply involved in both. But I think once you get into it, you realize there are enormous similarities. I think I would say I'm fairly traditional in my tastes. Most of my favorite American jazz is what's now termed as traditional. And I've discovered the same thing with the Cuban music I play. I think my preference is towards the early few decades. And I think in both cases, there are many, many, many similarities. There's a very similar sensibility to the music. There are incredible lyricists that wrote in talking about these two styles, that wrote these beautiful words to the songs, the, the nature of the songs, what they're about, I think is very similar in both cases. And I think the main difference really is the rhythm. They use a lot of the same instrumentation, many, many similarities. And of course, if you uh, look in your history books about the music, there was a lot of traffic of musicians between the United States and Cuba and Mexico and other islands in the Caribbean. So these musicians were all very much familiar and influenced by each other. Very interesting. What is it that you like about music? That's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess first and foremost, and it's very difficult to describe, it just makes you feel great. That's what attracted to me in, in the first place, and that's what keeps me there. It's a language in a way. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to travel to different countries and meet total strangers who you can't even have the language enough to say hello to, and yet you can all sit down and play together and communicate on a very significant deep level. It's a phenomenon, maybe we'll never fully understand it, but it's a, it's a wonderful thing to play. I think aside of that, I love the study of the instruments that I play. I play mainly the piano and the double bass. Since I first started both of them, it's involved many thousands and thousands of hours of study, which I enjoy. It's very, very fascinating the more you go into it. And not just technical study, but you study the history of the instruments, you study the how to read and write music and all that kind of thing, which is very fascinating and stimulates. And then on many, many levels, it's, it's a wonderful world. Difficult to describe. I don't know if that helps or not. <laughs> well, that's a very good answer, I think. One of the things I wanted to talk about was your solo album, Dizzy Fingers, a collection of Tin Pan Alley songs, and that just so happens to be my absolute favorite type of music of all. Wow, you're a, you're a man of great taste, if I may say. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> I was hoping you could tell us how you discovered that type of music, because sadly today it's becoming kind of forgotten. I mean, there are so many of those songs that are going to always be around. Yeah, it is. It's much neglected these days. I think the way I discovered it was through learning to play jazz. When I first started, I told you my father told me the boogie woogie. And then as I became more able with the instrument, playing the piano, 
he directed me towards his favorites, which were, as I mentioned, people like Oscar Peterson, but then a lot of the big names from the 60s and on in the jazz world, people like piano players like Horace Silver, Thelonious Monk, and on and on. And that was my first introduction to the music. You know, I took his lead and I listened to these guys and I loved it and it was wonderful. And I think because of my love for those artists, for example, if you listen to Oscar Peterson play and you love it and you're a musician yourself, it's a natural thing to then want to know about the man himself. And then you find out who his influences were as a little boy. Who did he listen to? Why did he get into it? So you go back a generation. And then you find yourself listening to R. Tatum or um, Nat King Cole, he was very much influenced by. And then you go through the same process again. You hear, wow, I never heard Tatum before. And you listen to it, and it's incredible. And you say, oh, I wonder how he started. And slowly but surely, you start going back in time just through your fascination of each musician as you come into them. And what I found was the further I went back, the more... I liked the music. And as you go back, you run into the repertoire of the era, and so you run into the Tim Pan Alley composers, who the modern guys do play them, but I think less and less. So I discovered this incredible world of uh, Tim Pan Alley and all the great compositions. And then even further back, you start to discover the pre-jazz, the music that was on the cusp of when jazz was born, and it led me to ragtime music and music from the turn of the last century and all that kind of thing. And it's, it just goes on and on. It's fascinating. And eventually, of course, it all connects with my classical education, which goes back, you know, several hundred years. You see how it all fits in together. It does seem like there is this huge thread that runs through music, and that's kind of what we've been doing on this show over the last few years, is just following the song lines and going from all different types of things. So I wanted to kind of talk about that from the Tin Pan Alley songs, which you covered. Do you have a favorite composer of that era? I have many, unfortunately. Such a, it's such a vast area. Again, difficult to know where to begin, but I'll mention a few that I particularly love. A gentleman called Walter Donaldson, who uh, wrote through the very end of the teens, through the 20s, 30s, and early 40s. And he wrote, for the benefit of your listeners, I'll mention a couple of titles that everybody knows. He wrote songs like Love Me or Leave Me, um, Yes Sir, That's My Baby, Making Whoopi and hundreds of others. Coming a little bit later, I love Johnny Green, who is a name that to most people wouldn't mean anything, but he wrote, he gave us such beautiful songs as Body and Soul, I Cover the Waterfront, Out of Nowhere, things like that, more in the 30s. Duke Ellington, of course, the great Duke Ellington, who was writing through the 20s and on all the way through to his death, very prolific writer, who gave us a vast amount of literature there are many, many, many hundreds that uh, we could go on with. There's, there's three of uh, my favorites. Jumping from the, your solo efforts to the Woody Allen New Orleans Jazz Band, how did you get hooked up with that band? Well, it all happened when I met the great Eddie Davis. And Eddie Davis is the musical director of the band and wonderful banjo player and singer. And I met Eddie about 10 years ago at a little club in Chelsea in New York City called The Cajun, which sadly closed about two years ago. And The Cajun was the last and only venue for New Orleans and Dixieland jazz in New York City. It had music about nine times a week. And I met Eddie Davis there one night. I was um, in the audience. I went to see the band play. I met Eddie on the intermission. He was curious to know why somebody of my age would be so into all this old music. And we got talking, and he invited me up to sit in with the band. And we became very good friends, and I started playing with his band down at the Cajun on a regular basis. And I didn't know anything about Eddie. I didn't know who he was or that he was connected with Woody Allen or anything like that. Sometime later, he asked me if I could substitute for the regular bass player, Greg Cohen, in, with Woody's band, because Greg was away on tour somewhere. 
And that's how it started. I started as a replacement guy for the double bass and also the piano. If either musician was away or sick, Eddie would call me to fill in. And then after some years, I became a regular member of the group. What was your impression of the musicians in the band when you first met them? I already knew by then, I think I knew probably everybody in the band except Jerry Zygmunt, who I know you, you've had on your show. We'd all known each other from various groups down at the Cajun once again, this old club. And I think Jerry was the only guy I hadn't met, and I met him on, on my first gig with Woody's band. And But it was the first time I'd heard everybody playing together and playing that kind of music. And uh, it was a very exciting experience. And to top it all, you know, to be playing with Woody Allen, who obviously is a celebrity and in this wonderful place of the Cathay Carlisle. And uh, it, was a, it was a very exciting night. I remember it very well. When someone goes to see the Woody Allen New Orleans Jazz Band, and it's kind of like the Tin Pan Alley music in that it's a, kind of a neglected type of music, what is it that you hope that the people that go see you guys perform, what do you hope the listeners get out of that experience? I hope that the people that come and see us get a chance, a little hour, hour and a half window into a world that most of them know nothing about and are never exposed to through the regular media channels. For me, it's a wonderful style of music that is, is irresistible to me. When you hear it, when you're in the room, it's being played. It's just fantastic music. I would say almost 100% of the time, that's the response from our audiences. I think, yes, they're excited because Woody Allen's in the room. Absolutely, of course. And a lot of them come... I would say most of them come just because he's there and they know him from the movies and they want to see the celebrity up there. But I think, I really think most people are extremely surprised at what a wonderful time they have. And we get so many comments afterwards about, oh, wow, you know, I've never heard this music before. Where can I find this kind of music? Uh, tell me about this music. Where is it from? Give me some examples of CDs I can go and buy. And you see, you see it in their faces and in their responses afterwards that they love it and they kind of in wonderment as to how come I've never heard this great stuff before. So that's kind of refreshing. Although it's also a sad reminder of how little of it is out there. I hope to see uh, the Woody Allen New Orleans Jazz Band sometimes. Yeah, you should come along and see us. Well, I have two final questions before we go. Two questions I ask of all of my guests. One somewhat lighthearted, but I believe there's some meaning behind it. And another one a little more serious. The first one, what is your all-time favorite meal? All-time favorite meal. Wow. <laughs> Maybe the hardest question there is. <laughs> That's a tough one. All right, I'm going to throw this one out there. It's, it's not my all-time one. It's got to be up there. And that is a meal I've enjoyed up in Cape Cod, and it's lobster with uh, clam bake, sweet corn, and baked potato. It's to die for. <laughs> I like the way you think. <laughs> it's wonderful. Although I've had a lot of great food in my time, that. That comes to mind right now. Well, my last question, given the fact that your interest in music is on a worldwide scale, music being the universal language, and given that this program is going out all over the world, I was wondering what you would like to say to the world. What would you like to say to all those people that are listening in? Wow, on a musical note? Anything, really. Well, since we're talking about the music we've been talking about, I would encourage your listeners to go and have a look on the Internet. It's all there. Go and have a look at any of the American popular music from the teens, 20s, and 30s, and there's an enormous amount of it, and some of it they call jazz, some of it is just popular music from that time, and see what a treasure trove there is. And having done that, try the same experiment with music from another country of the same period and you'll find that time around the world the, the music is seems to be consistently rich and wonderful and enjoyable and it has a very different sensibility to music today i think i'll give a little warning with that if you're used to today's music it's going to take a slightly different palette to uh you know get used to 
because it's not so in your face and aggressive and, and uh, electronic and all that kind of stuff. But it's uh, it's wonderful and uh, highly recommend it. Keep keeps you young. A lot of many hours of enjoyment there for you. Very insightful answer. Thank you so very much for giving of your time and giving us an interview. And I look forward to maybe seeing you this December. I might be going up there to catch one of your concerts. Just Wonderful. And, and once again, thank you very much for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure talking to you.